They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet Jesus and cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Please pray with me. Oh, holy God, creator of all that was, is, or ever shall be, draw our attention today towards this celebration of Jesus' earthly ministry now at hand. How easily we get distracted by other things and miss this parade when our best hope of getting out of the mud and mire in which we find ourselves comes to town, please count us among those who show up to cheer him on for all he did and for all he will yet do. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts in C2 at home, here in house, during the week, whenever we are gathered, wherever we are scattered, we know and we believe that you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is a prominent writer who says this about courage. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. We'll remember that today. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. Good morning, church. It's Palm Sunday. Easter's coming. Welcome to the Palm Sunday Parade. Before this hour ends, this very hour, you will be encountered by Jesus face to face as he turns from the crowd to ask you this. What is it that you want me to do for you? What is it? that you want me to do for you. Your response will be the point of courage where new life begins. I cherish a newspaper photo of my two young grandsons, Taryn and Trent, leaning out of the back windows of the family car toward the Olympic torch about to parade past them. They excitedly wave Olympic flags as the runners approach, eager to catch their first glimpse of the international torch that symbolizes the light of spirit, knowledge, and life. By passing the flame from one person to another in stages, that infamous torch relay prior to the start of every Olympic game expresses the handing down of this symbolic fire from generation to generation. I asked our daughter this week if those now grown boys remember that day. That's hard to say, she reflected. They were pretty young. Maybe they remember that day because we've told them about it over and over again. Or maybe they just remember it because that, that framed newspaper photo is on the wall that they have to pass by every day. Or maybe they actually remember what it was like the day they were there. We remember just such a moment with Jesus as if we were there because we too have heard this story so many times. We remember when he arrived outside Jerusalem to this festival crowd. <clears throat> Children and dogs and extended relatives tumbled into the streets burgeoning with holiday travelers. We remember that the Passover preparations had already begun. Lambs about to be sacrificed for the feast were innocently munching on their last grain. We remember the intensifying murmur of the crowd as a renowned teacher made his way into town. Did you see D Jesus, we hear? He's apparently traveling right behind us, we say. Let's stop and wait for him. Perhaps he'll have a message for us today of hope. Perhaps he'll stop and heal one of us by a touch. Many of us love a good parade, although I know there's a, those of among you that close the door and shut the blinds when there's a parade because you just can't stand the crowds. But just a few weeks ago, a friend of mine and I ran all over Central Beach looking for the Clydesdale horses when they came to town. Anybody else go? We weren't disappointed, yet today we celebrate a different kind of parade, not the passing torch of Olympic athletes, not famous horses advertising beer as it turns out, not Christmas parade or the 4th of July. Today, we sing Hosanna to the light and the life of the world. Thanks be to God. We remember Palm Sunday as if we were there. Because if we come to church ever, 
We've always come here now, if we could, at the beginning of Holy Week, eager to lay down our palms and sing our hosannas for the King. We hope Jesus will courageously lead us to a better world. We didn't know then how much courage would be required of us when it was our turn to first receive and then pass on that light of the world. Most of us miss the Palm Sunday parade now. Christians around the world reenact Jesus' procession into town this morning in all kinds of elaborate ways. Volunteers ride a colt depicting Jesus' kingship. In other countries, the streets are littered with flowers or elaborate artistic design. As crowds gather unknowingly to walk Jesus towards his final journey to the cross, we tend to prepare a little differently. We gas up the car. We pick up a deli chicken. We finish our taxes. You don't have much time left if you're not done. Yet we wonder, where is this Jesus now in this world that seems as scrambled as that of the Roman Empire? What hope is there yet that Christ will bring when the corruption and abuse of power that provoked Jesus to throw money changers out of the temple back then still continues today? What route will the Jesus parade take up now to turn this upside-down earthly kingdom into the right-side-up realm of God? God knows we need a shift in direction. A whole bunch of folks are headed down the wrong road, the wrong way, a long time now. We wonder what, if anything, is going to turn things around. The news just yesterday speculated that if we don't get some rails around the potential abuse of artificial intelligence, this will be the beginning of the end of humankind. It used the word extinction. If we're curious about this, or we're discouraged about that, whatever the that may be, or hopeless about all manner of things, then maybe it's time to stop what we're doing and come to the Jesus parade. Oh, look, you did. Here you are. The last time we read this particular version of the gospel, there's also other versions in other one of the gospel writings. The last time we read it was Palm Sunday, April 5th, 2020. I preached then to a completely empty house just a couple of weeks after this building sequestered shut due to COVID. As church leaders, you remember, Steve, you were there as moderator at the time, we imagined we'd be worshiping online for two to four weeks. If we shut down entirely as a country, we imagined the virus would pass us by, and then we would return to business as usual along with the rest of the world. Without debating the merit of what we could have, should have done or didn't do, that's not what we're here for today, the virus did not pass us by. When the air finally cleared, we emerged blinking into a place unlike any place we'd ever been before <clears throat> to discover that, that there was not then, nor will there ever be, a return to business as usual. It took courage to be the church then. It takes courage to be the church now. It takes courage always to be a Christian. These are perilous times. When the world gets chaotic and we face a, an uncertain future, some of us begin to overfunction. We kick into high gear. We try to solve impossible problems all by ourselves. We figure out solutions we think will make everything all right. Some of us even have a tendency in such a time as this to lay palms in the road where we think Jesus ought to walk and in the direction we think Jesus ought to be going. And maybe we even look back over our shoulder to see if Jesus is following us. Unless you have a different version of the Bible than I do, that's not how this story goes. You see, Jesus picked a couple of disciples and he sent them on ahead to prepare, renting the room for the Passover meal, procuring a donkey for his humble ride into Jer Jerusalem. Though they were out there preparing ahead of him, they were following his lead, not their own the crowds along the side of the road lay down their cloaks and branches to prepare the parade route as if laying out the red carpet for a famous leader or a king, as was the custom of that time. 
Still others got the news a little late and no doubt chased after him, hoping to catch a glimpse of this now famous healer who made blind men see, healed lepers and fed the hungry, all to proclaim that the kingdom of God was now at hand. What great news is that indeed? Those of us accustomed to commanding our own universe have always thought we knew so clearly where Jesus was headed that it isn't surprising that we've been out ahead of the crowd laying down palms for where we believe he's going, or ought to. Only Jesus changed directions while we were busy making our own plans. The course was not as straight as we might have imagined. We don't yet know where Jesus will take us in the future. But today's story leaves breadcrumbs for our courageous life ahead. The greatest... Uh, British theologian C.S. Lewis wrote, Courage is the form of every virtue at its testing point, and Holy Week tests our courage. Four Palm Sundays ago on 60 Minutes, a military commander who led several tours in Afghanistan before the fall wrote about a new curriculum being used to teach soldiers how to be courageous in the line of duty. She talked about how the paradigm or model for teaching the military to be courageous has changed since World War II. At that time, we held up a model of John Wayne courage that leans in and powers through. And there was clearly a time for this kind of courage, and it built our nation in a particular way at a distinct time in our history. Yet as the book of Ecclesiastes says, for everything there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And now is the time to practice another kind of courage altogether. What seems a new model of courage, as it turns out, has been there all along. Courage is Jesus riding a humble donkey or colt into Jerusalem instead of a tank. Jesus is knowing there were people there who wanted to kill him, but going anyway. Courage is a woman giving birth who experiences suffering that she hopes but has no guarantee will lead to life. Courage is the speaker we had here last Sunday morning. If you don't know who it is, you can ask someone. We're not able to name her for her safety, who educates with single-minded devotion an e eager group of future leaders of the world under the most adverse possible circumstances. When Jesus entered Jerusalem that day, with courage and single-minded devotion, he chased the money changers, extorting the poor with a pay-to-play required temple tax out of the temple. With, he, they were doing that to line their own pockets as leaders. Without counting the cost, Jesus turned over the chairs of those who price-gouged the poor at 20 times what it cost for a retired required temple sacrifice, accusing them of desecrating the holy, of creating a den of thieves. Once the temple cleared, those in need of healing came to him. And inside of the religious leaders, Jesus healed them. Once the temple cleared, he asked them, what is it you want me to do for you? And he made them well. And then children shouted out, Hosanna to the son of David, essentially recognizing Hosanna, the long-expected king, out of the mouths of babes, the scripture says. You see, the courage Jesus requires of us today is not to orchestrate the parade. Disciples have already gone on ahead and accomplished that goal. It's not up to us to plan the security or to lead the parade route from in front. God's upside-down kingdom starts now when we follow Jesus from behind all the way to Jerusalem. We follow him into the temple where he clears holy ground of all distraction. Wouldn't that be good news? The cloud, crowds clamor with worldly concerns behind us. They're not going away. And the authorities plot trouble in front of us out there. They're not going away either. Yet Jesus stands right before us and asks us the courageous question that requires our, or invites, our courageous response. What do you want me to do for you? You see, before the Last Supper, and the, before the arrest, and before the execution, and the funeral, and the empty tomb, and what happens beyond, 
our story actually begins here in the temple with Jesus. Today, he already risks his life entering a den of thieves in order to clear out the emergency room so that you and I can be made well and live. What do you want most for Jesus to do for you today? Not everyone Jesus asked was willing to answer this question. It takes courage to ask for what you want and need. The rich young ruler went away sadly because what he needed most from Jesus he was unwilling to receive and then unwilling to share. The man who sat begging his whole life by the sheep gate pool almost remained stuck there, paralyzed, making excuses when Jesus asked him if he wanted to be healed until Jesus said, come on, take up your pallet and walk. It takes great courage to trust that Jesus can and will grant you whatever you need in order to be made well and enjoy this full and abundant life. And Jesus came through on a colt to offer it to you today. Do you have the courage to receive it? The healings that took place that day in the temple outraged the authorities who witnessed it. Jesus' courageous final act embodied the love he taught us as a way of life, just in case anybody missed the memo. Love one another, heal one another, care for one another, but first let me love you. No expensive animal sacrifice at any price could substitute for Jesus' costly acts of grace. This costly grace Jesus offers to each of us now. Jesus didn't turn over the temples or cleanse the temple for nothing. He didn't turn over the tables. As much as Jesus enjoyed laughter and a good meal with friends, he courageously loved on people even when it was unpopular, even when it was illegal as it was when he healed on the Sabbath. Even at the end, he loved people to his death. Jesus heals us in every broken corner of our concern so that we can then pass on the light of life forward to the next set of eager and waiting hands. We won't know, none of us will know until looking back when it is in this life that we've been brave. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. So just for today... Pick up your cloak of courage and follow Jesus wherever your future may lead. May it be so. Blessed Palm Sunday. Amen.